podcast party to slay a dragon. Ariadne Torek. You wake up with a coppery taste in your mouth. You're lying on your stomach, half your face pressed against the muddy ground. You smell acrid smoke mixed with the familiar musky scent of the Moor Run River. Your eyes open slowly. Sound is muffled and your vision is blurred. Smears of white on black resolve into a starry, smoky sky above you. Yellow and orange flashes nearby clarify into gouts of flame. The fishing boats pulled out near the docks are on fire. Muffled, distant noises sharpen into cries of pain and terror and aggressive, vicious, rasping barks. To your right, a man lies face up on the ground, mouth open, eyes staring up into the sky. <sighs> okay, okay, I need a plan. Um, I want to go check on the man. You creep over to him and you recognize him almost immediately. He is one of your father's deputies, specifically Deputy J.L. Lakin. He looks horribly wounded. It looks like there's a wound to his neck and the ground around him, the sort of marshy riverbed. It smells coppery. It's pretty dark, but by the flames of the burning boats, you are getting some color across the grass and you can see that there's the red stain of blood in a growing pool around him. He moans a little bit and his eyes are wide and staring at you. You can see there's a large gash in his neck. Like, and you idiot. Is there anything I can do to try and help him? Even if it's just rip off a piece of my, my clothing to stop the blood? Yeah, make a wisdom medicine check. That's a natural one. Starting off okay. strong. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Perfect. <laughs> you look around uh, helplessly. You've seen a uh, sawfish will bite deeply into somebody. Somebody will be stung by an eel. You've seen some... Occasionally there is a skirmish with lizard folk or bandits, but Jail is wounded far more seriously than you've ever seen a person wounded before. His eyes grow wide and one arm lifts up about 30 degrees and points past you to the west. He gurgles and uh, blood bubbles from his mouth and nose as his index finger extends pointing west. What was west? What was west, Lakin? Tell me now! Don't die, don't die, don't die, don't die! He twists around painfully, still pointing, and you can see about a foot in front of him, there are two swords, a long sword and a short sword, lying on the ground with a trail of blood leading west away from them. He points past the swords, and you see two scaly reptilian creatures with long, sleek heads, glowing yellow eyes, and red skin charging across the wet ground towards you. The sound of a couple of arrows leaving their bow, and even as Lakin points towards the approaching creatures, two arrows thud into his chest. He gasps and his arm flops completely still on the ground, and his head turns to the side and he stops breathing. You can see there are two arrows with black fletching extending from his chest and the creatures are now bearing down on you, and we can go ahead and roll initiative. Making a grab for that long sword. <laughs> I need to retire this dice immediately, it's a two. All right, the two creatures shriek, and two arrows arc towards you out of the darkness. They're semi-silhouetted by the flaming boats behind them, but you hear the whistling of their shots, even though they're mostly masked by their bodies. First hit is a 14. That's not gonna hit me. Yay. Second is a 21. Oh, that will hit. Okay, an arrow thuds into your shoulder, Ariadne. You take seven points of piercing damage, and they will use their movements to close the distance on you. One of them steps directly on Lakin's body. Its feet squelch over his chest and punch through his ribs, and they are moving on either side of you to flank you. You now have a good okay. look at them. They're both smaller than you, Ariadne. They're about three feet tall. They are snarling and yipping and peering up at you. They have put their bows on their backs 
and they are each now brandishing wicked edged short swords at you. But it is your turn, Ariadne. Don't you dare step on him. I'm gonna, in my anger, make a swing with my long sword. Okay, so I assume you pick up the sword from the ground. Oh yeah, pick up the sword from the, the ground and go with the one who's stepping on my friend. Okay, you reach down, the two blades on the ground. There's a long sword and a short sword there, Ariadne. You immediately recognize them. You've seen them almost every day of your life. They both belong to your father, Sheriff Brand Torek. Yeah, you can actually hold one in each hand. Oh, cool. Then I take both. So, my first swing with the long sword, and then since I'm a, a multi attack, I'll take a second swing with my short sword. Awesome. Nine to hit. Do you swing over its head? It crouches down around your knees and snickers at you. <laughs> you can go ahead and make your second attack. Amber, aim lower. <laughs> That's a 16 to hit. A 16 yeah. will hit. Ooh, laugh while you can. Ooh, I get a D8 for this. That's fun. That's a uh, four points of damage. You slash it across the shoulder. You notice that it is wearing crazy quilt padded leather armor. And as you strike it, you see both feathers and hay come out of the uh, pauldron that you ripped. It screeches, and they both move to swing at you again, unless there's something else you'd like to do. I'd like to use my movement to get out from in between them. I realize I may have an attack of opportunity, but I don't want to be in between. You actually have a special ability called tactical movement, where until the end of your turn, you can choose to move at half of your normal speed without provoking opportunity attacks. Very nice. That's fantastic. Well, I'm definitely going to do that. I'm going to swing on the other side of the one that is standing on Larkin. So you step swiftly around that cobalt. The other one, the one that was attempting to flank you, by the time it reacts to the fact that you're stepping away from it, you are already gone. Uh, And it jabs its sword into the grass where you are no longer standing. It is their turn again. They are not capable of flanking you now because you are almost standing at the river's edge. They both charge up to get into position, but they're not able to get in on either side of you. Your back is almost against the trunk of a large tree growing out of the shore. Oh, unfortunately, they do have pack tactics, so they are both going to swing with their short swords with advantage. The first one, even with advantage, the sword just swings and chips some bark off of the tree behind you, and the other one with advantage will get a 21 again. Eight points of damage, it slashes you in the thigh. Oh no. Can I use my reaction for an offhand counter? Absolutely. That's another nine. I'm just rolling through dice. You try to swing back at the first Cobalt who missed you and stuck his sword in the tree. He does manage to pull his sword out and parry your counterattack. The sound of steel against steel rings out across the riverfront. Now that you're pushed back towards the river with your back against this tree trunk, Ariadne, you notice that there is activity on the river behind you. You have a a fleeting glimpse of a stolen boat, one of the fisher boats. You recognize the familiar silhouette of the vessel, and it is rushing rapidly downriver away from the docks. It is packed with jeering kobolds who are wielding torches, cheering, and screeching in the uh, darkness over the sound of the rushing water. And you can see in the middle of this pack of kobolds, Balls is a bound and gagged Talingbet. Oh no. It is your turn again, Ariad. Talingbet, no. Um, I'm fueled by a little bit of extra anger at the fact that the person I love most in the world is now captured and hurtling down this river. Quite unhappy about this. I'm going to take a swing at the one to the right of me that had missed me the first time. Come on, dice. I'm cursed. Absolutely cursed. That's a seven. It leaps back, just like Matrix bends backwards out of the arc of your swing. (laughs) (laughs) And it raises its sword and gives a cheer towards the boat that is moving upriver that is returned by the creatures in that boat. They are screeching to each other in a language that you do not understand, Ariad. You do have your your other attack. Okay, I'm gonna take another swing at him. Okay, better. It's a 12 to hit. 12 does not hit. No! Meanwhile, I would like Belton, 
Violet, and Malibu to make a group wisdom survival check, which will determine how quickly the three of you were able to follow the noise, the sounds, the fire, and the fleeing villagers to arrive at the scene of this raid on the riverfront. Oh, I've definitely oh. figured it out. The higher you, you average as a group, the fewer rounds it'll be until you arrive here. Thanks, everybody. Harry, <laughs> <laughs> what'd you roll? Violet got a 19. Malibu is very wounded still, and his hair is starting to turn a weird white color, and he rolled a natural one for a three. And Belton, overcome by the knowledge that he now has 500 gold in his pocket, has rolled an eight. You have rushed through the town streets, this this sleepy but rapidly awakening and horrified town streets of Hengistbury towards the river, but that is an average roll of 10 for survival, so I will keep that in mind in determining uh, how quickly you arrive on the scene. Ariadne the Kobold next to you will attack again with advantage. Oh. I'm running, but I'm a gnome, so I'm not okay. It's just your little feet. It swings viciously. It hacks. Wood is chipping off of that tree behind you, but you do manage to avoid it. The other kobold clutches and massages a gland in its throat and swings slightly to your left, Ariadne. Oh, boy. And it begins to make chuffing sounds from its chest cavity, and you see, like, red embers glowing under the skin of its neck, and then it drops its jaw open, and there is a gout of flame, which fires from the kobold's mouth towards you and the tree behind you. You must make a dexterity saving throw. 11. 11 is a success. Yay! So you Hallelujah. mostly dodge out of the way. And it's a, the aim is a little high. The tree lights up like a torch. It's full of leaves. It is late summer and immediately starts blazing brightly, illuminating the entire riverfront area. You can see the dead deputy, the trail of blood leading away from where you fell back towards town, the flaming boats nearby, the other boat with Talingbet and his kidnappers receding into the dark river. And you are scorched, Ariadne, for seven fire damage. Oh my God. As most of the flame passes above you. Do we see that tree? Is that an indication? Like, do we? Yeah, so you see, I mean, there are numerous sources of fire on the riverfront, Violet, but you do see like a beacon, a tree very close to the water and also very close to the main docks suddenly light up. Ariadne, it is your turn. That little bit of singeing really hurt, so everybody in the, the mile range could probably hear me scream in anger and pain but I'm gonna take a swing at the same one again. That is a 15 to hit. A 15 does hit. Whew. That's 11 points of damage. All right. You bring the longsword down in a chopping motion. Blood splatters up your arm. It and clutches at the wound, staring away from you a little bit. It drops to one knee and drags itself back up to its feet. It is horribly wounded, Ariadne, but it is not down. You can see panic in its eyes, and the kobold next to it, its head swivels around and looks at that one and says, Sirat, 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 Sirat. The other one begins to take up the same chant, Sirat, Sirat, and they both raise their swords defiantly at you. The other one is going to try to recover its breath weapon. Oh my god. Okay, well, I'm going to attack that one before he can, hopefully. That's 10 to hit. You swing out of the way, but you do seem to distract it as it coughs and gurgles. The flames flicker, those cinders flicker in its throat again, and then die out. It was not able to recover its breath weapon. Instead, it just lunges at you with the short sword again. Uh, it will hit. This one will do nine points oh of my slashing God. damage. And its partner follows suit. But well, the other one, the one you badly wounded, it seems to be more demoralized despite the rousing chants from its companion. It takes a weak swing and misses you. And it is at that moment that Belton, Violet, 
and Malibu appear at the edge of the docks. And <sighs> Belton, Violet, and Malibu, I'd like all three of you to please roll yourselves into initiative. And this will be using wisdom perception. Oh my <laughs> god. Uh, Violet got a four. Malibu actually got a 22. Belton's still counting coins. He got a five. Malibu, you have the first move. Malibu is not feeling well from getting knocked down in that last fight. So you can see that Ariadne has been cornered by two. You've seen kobolds before. They're unmistakably a couple of kobolds brandishing short swords at the base of a flaming tree. There's a little footbridge spanning a kind of a stream or an inlet from the river leading across to the area where she is from where you're standing. A little wooden footbridge, maybe about 10 feet by five feet. I don't think Malibu's ever met her before. That's correct. So he'll look at the other two and go, are we fighting the, um, the kobolds or the girl? Definitely the kobolds, the kobolds. Okay. Malibu will move on to the footbridge, gets about halfway across the footbridge, and he holds out his hand, and a spectral hand comes out of it, and he is going to cast Chill Touch on the closest kobold to him, the one on the other side of the fire. That's a natural 20. All right. So that does eight points of necrotic damage. The spectral hand falls on the kobold's shoulder. It did not see you. It shrieks and turns around and starts scrabbling frantically, but its claws are passing through that insubstantial hand. It's panicked by its inability to remove it. The rotting necrotic damage spreads through its body. Okay, yeah, it is wounded, but it is still there. It uh, now glares towards you, and both kobolds look up to see your party approaching from the other side of that little inlet. And Malibu standing on the footbridge. It is their turn. They turn towards their initial prey. One of them jabbers and points. So you hear them, and it points directly at Ariadne. Yes, yes. Uh, and kind of pulls at the hem of her skirt a little bit and then points towards the river. The other one nods and they both slash at her again. Badly wounded one misses you both times again, Ariadne. Other one got a 14. 14 will miss. Okay, yeah, so even with advantage, they're both wounded, they're both a little frantic. They're sort of slashing at you in the darkness and chaos of the fire. They both miss. Belton, it is your turn. In the dim light of the fire from these boats, as well as the firelight from this bonfire, that seems Mm -hmm. to be where the enemies are, can I see further down towards uh, the the docks and the river? Or I know I don't have dark vision, but I guess I wanted to see if if I could see past them towards the river. There's boats to the west of the docks that are on fire. The docks themselves look undamaged. You can hear screeches coming from the dark river, but without dark vision at this distance, you know, you have a sense of where the shore of the river is and that there's some kind of activity going on on it, likely boats just putting two and two together, but you can't see much on the river at all. Belton will will glance out towards the river, but then draw his short bow, walk 10 feet towards the kobolds, and then I will take a shot with my short bow. Yes. That's 17 to hit. 17 will certainly hit. Which one were you aiming for, Belton? I was aiming at the one closest to me, which is the one sort of southwest from where Ariadne is, right next to the body. So you shoot him in the side, it goes under his armpit. Damage on that? Total damage is 17 damage. So this is the one that had been hit by Malibu's chill touch. There is a sick crunch Ariadne as an arrow punches underneath the arm of this creature. It sags. You can actually see the point coming out the front of its chest. It coughs and staggers and almost goes down, but it does not. This thing is still on its feet. Oh my God. Anything else, Belton? Belton's smile suddenly disappears as he doesn't understand how something could take a hit like that and still be standing. Violet, it's your turn. Ariadne, I'm coming. And she's going to run 30 feet to get to the beginning of this footbridge where Malibu is. You notice there's blood on the boards of that bridge, Violet. There's a trail. You actually, you're sort of following it backwards. Looks like somebody bleeding staggered away and bled on the bridge and headed back towards town from here. I see that these things are getting hit quite a bit and not going down yet, so I'm going to cast Magic Missile at the one closest to us that's badly wounded. All right, so that's three, so that does nine points of force damage. Okay, all targeting the same one? Yes. 
all three arc over the footbridge, swirl around the little peninsula where Ariadne is fighting off these two creatures and impact with the cobalt. It screeches, smoke is pouring from its wounds, and it collapses dead at Ariadne's feet. There we go. Stay strong, stay strong, we're coming. Uh, I'm gonna stay where I am. Ariadne, it is your turn. Thank the stars that you're here. Is my father okay? Have you seen him? And I say this while taking a another swing with my long sword at the pesky cobalt. That's a eight. It dodges. It's looking now at Malibu and Violet on the bridge. It's kind of gaze is flicking between you and them. It looks very nervous, but it does duck under your first swing. Swing number two with my short sword. 14 to hit. 14 does not hit. Mm. Your swing goes right by its face. Its eyes kind of go cross-eyed, staring at the blade an inch from its nose, but then looks skyward and kind of makes a prayer gesture as it avoids death. I would like to tactically move away to give myself some space. Go ahead. You can move half your movement without drawing an attack of opportunity. Okay, so you step about 10 feet away from the kobold, and it is Malibu's turn. Malibu is just going to casually walk right up to it and right next to it, pull out his morning star that's covered in vines, swinging it over his head, and take a shot at it. That is a 17. 17 hits. It takes five bludgeoning damage, but when it hits, fire runs up Malibu's arm and hits it for another d6 with his fiery armaments for another four points of fire damage. Nine damage total. Correct. It screeches and clutches at the flaming wound, staggering back, puts one hand on the tree to steady itself. It is burned and horribly wounded. Anything else, Malibu? Okay, he's going to throw his head back and his hair is going to fly all around him and he is going to go into his rage, his rage glamour, where he looks beautiful and gets a little fuzzy and soft and a little, Amazing. little more resistant to damage. And he's going to look at Ariadne and go, don't worry, I got you. I got you. You're good. That's his turn. It drops down on all fours in front of you, Malibu. It's sort of locking eyes with your knees. Its jaw drops open and a cone of flame bursts from its mouth. Malibu, you must make a dexterity saving throw, which I think we now know because you have danger sense, you should have advantage on, I think. Now he remembers that he can jump out of the way of things like this. He rolled a 17. Okay, that is a success. You leap mostly out of the way of the flames, Malibu, but you do take, yes, yeah, six points of fire damage. It is Belton's turn. Knowing that Malibu is there, Belton's just going to take another arrow out of his quiver and just fire another shot at this cobalt. Don't think we'll hit with a seven. Yeah, the arrow just disappears into that flaming tree behind the cobalt belt and anything else. Yeah, with my bonus action, I'm going to move my full 35 feet of motion as a dash, continuing on past Violet, who I will just sort of lightly tap on the shoulder. And then if she looks, smile and then move through her space. That is action, bonus action, movement. Violet, it is your turn. I'm going to follow everyone. I'm going to move 25 feet, so I'm standing right next to the fire. There's still about 15 feet between me and the kobold. And I'm going to try that cool thing that Malibu did. And I'm going to say a tingere reche. And a skeletal hand is going to form on the shoulder of the kobold. And I'm going to cast Chill Touch. That's a 22. Okay, so that does hit. Tap one finger and boop the kobold on the nose with it. Yes. It screeches. <laughs> It's one point of necrotic humiliation. <laughs> the hand is clutching at its nose. It does take one point of necrotic damage, but it is still up. Anything else, Violet? No, that's it. I'm thinking about my life choices. Okay, Ariadne. Uh, they have it quite well in hand right now, and I am hurting. So if there's anything I can do to help myself, I would like to do that. Make a wisdom perception check, Ariadne. That is an 11. Ariadne, you notice that lying under J.L. Lakin's body, protruding from beneath his back, is his heavy crossbow. Well, as I'm right next to him, I don't have to move closer. I'm going to try and push him off of the crossbow and pull it out. The body rolls heavily and sickly off of the weapon. You see that a bolt is loaded into the stock of the crossbow. I'm going to use my movement to take another step backwards five feet and take a shot at the last one. An 11 to hit. It thuds into the base of the tree. Anything else, Ariadne? <laughs> oh, I'm cursed. 
As of now, no. I'm just trying to stay out of the way and not die. Malibu is going to swing around to the backside of the kobold, leaving room for Belton on the other side, and and take another swing at it with his Morning Star. That's a 24. All right. It definitely hits. So he takes four points of bludgeoning damage, then once again, fire rolls down his arm, and he takes a d6, another two, so he takes a total of six points of damage. You swing around behind him and smash the Morning Star into his back. He staggers forward, dropping again to all fours. His head slowly turns around to look at you again, Malibu. One eye has gone dark. He is not dead. Anything else? Yes, with his bonus action, because he's medium parrying shield, he can take a shot at it with his shield. So he's going to try to shield bash this thing to death. That's a 20. A 20 hits. Four more points of bludgeoning damage. How do you dispatch the kobold? Yeah. <laughs> I just, as he turns, I just want to smash his face kind of flat and then just smash him into the ground like five or okay. six times. You drive his head down into the wet turf of the riverbank. His arms and legs stop twitching and he lies still on the ground. We are out of combat. The moment he's down, Malibu's going to put his foot on the dead kobold and he's going to turn around and whip his hair around and just smile at Ariadne (laughs) and pose. Yeah, so you're surrounded by the corpses of two kobolds and Ariadne's, her father's uh, deputy bleeding. (laughs) No, just setting the scene. Uh, Bleeding out also uh, near your feet. The tree blazes behind you, Malibu. You can hear cries of panicked and wounded citizens of Hengisbury, people calling for their loved ones, people calling for help, voices echoing across the river, the sounds of the rushing river, and the flames of the burning boats. Most importantly, there's a big flaming tree behind him. He looks really good. Ariadne does not think so. She um, <laughs> she is not worried about you at all. She's very focused. She thinks you're kind of silly and yeah. will be making her way back towards Lakin. Before she, she kneels down to see Lakin, she's going to give the dead kobold a kick and spit on it. She's very, very unhappy. There's a satisfying squelch from the kobold's corpse. Ariadne, where's Tlingbet? Are you okay? They took him. They took him. I'm not okay. I'm not okay at all. They took him. Where? I point at the the river and say, a boat, it moved away and he was tied up and and there were kobolds everywhere, everywhere. Where is my father? Ariadne, uh, listen, first of all, glad you're okay. Glad we could be of assistance. You're welcome. Your father's being seen too. You don't have to like flip your lid. He's going to be fine. Oh, I immediately there, I, I've done my, my I've done my job. That's good. That's good. Yes. Um, yes. I have I, I have seen to her emotional. I was going to say, uh, if you wouldn't let's mind. them. I was going to say, can we, can we just take a look and see what they got? You know, maybe yeah, 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 around yeah, for yeah. loose change. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> that one's yours. This one's mine. I'm going to look out onto the water. Do I see a boat that maybe is the boat in question? Make a wisdom perception check, Violet. Oh, God, that's a three. The starlight from above is largely obscured by the smoke rising from the many fires around you, Violet. You peer out over the river. You can see the dark surface of the water. Think you can see maybe in the distance rapidly moving upriver towards Blackford and Thornberry. Torchlight that indicate a, a skiff or a rowboat moving in that direction. Can't make out any details about it, though. It's some distance off at this point, maybe more than a quarter mile. Is the dead kobold wearing a cloak of some sort? They are wearing patchwork, crazy quilt, padded leather armor. Looks like mostly scavenged and stolen materials, crudely stitched together with leather stitch work, like hide, untanned hide stitches. You know, there's like some of it looks like it's like they right. stuffed bed sheets. There's like uh-huh. a, 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 maybe a stolen lady's dress, but also like maybe some pieces of scavenged militia armor or outdated armor from like a war from last century. It's not like a regular uniform. Okay, I am desperately trying to look out and see where Tlingbet has gone. I'm not seeing anything. I'm getting more and more desperate about the fact that we don't know anything about this and there's no one to ask because everyone involved seems to be dead. And so I look down at the kobold and I see a sort of secondary image of the kobold. It's a ghostly sort of image of the kobold. And I feel like I could speak to it. Oh. Cool. 
Hi, everybody. It's me, your Dungeon Master, Tal Aviazer. Hope you're enjoying Episode 3 of Podcast Party to Slay a Dragon, presented by Cast Party and EN Publishing. Show will be back shortly for the second part. For this series, we're using Level Up Advanced 5th Edition to enhance the classic D&D 5e experience. For more on these cool new rules and enhancements for your 5th Edition D&D games, visit levelupa5e.com. You can also purchase this adventure as part of Level Up A5E's awesome new release to save a kingdom, available in both hardcover and PDF formats. Our annual year-end episode of Power Word Talk is coming up shockingly soon. If you have questions about the podcast that you'd like us to answer on the show, email them to us at info at cast-party.com or message me with them on Discord. If you're a new listener and you're enjoying this adventure, you should also check out Podcast Party Descent into Avernus as we travel to hell and hopefully back in a quest to save the stolen city of Elturel from eternal damnation. We have almost three years of episodes available now, and new episodes come out right in this feed. Earlier this year, you helped make possible our upcoming Secrets of the Blind Palace actual play series by making Secrets of the Blind Palace go platinum on Dungeon Master's Guild. Well, now another of my adventures, Attack on Copper Coil, is just 27 sales away from going gold. That is like platinum, but less impressive, but still great. So we have another proposal for you. If Attack on Copper Coil goes gold on DM's Guild before we begin recording Secrets of the Blind Palace next year, then that miniseries will become a little longer and will include actual plays of both Secrets of the Blind Palace and Attack on Copper Coil. Attack on Copper Coil is a four to seven hour Dungeons and Dragons 5e adventure for characters level one through four. Purchases of both the PDF version or the Roll20 PDF bundle will count towards making the Copper Coil cast happen. Follow the link in the show notes to purchase that or grab it at dmsguild.com. Would you like to dress up in a dead cobalt's clothes and talk to the ghost of a different dead cobalt like Violet did in this episode? Cast Party's professional dungeon masters are available to hire for online games. We have games for kids as well as adults, and our DMs can run almost any of the official Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition adventures, as well as third-party adventures, and even some we've created ourselves. Details at cast-party.com. Do you ever feel like you have a great visual picture in your head, but you need a little help putting it into words? Well, with a subscription to Describe, you can access thousands of descriptions of monsters, spells, locations, and more, as well as maps, music, and sound effects to enhance your games, only at Describe.com. That's D-S-C-R-Y-B dot com. Would you like 10% off that subscription? Follow the link in the show notes and use the code CASTPARTY all one word, all caps, to save 10% on your first subscription. Check us out at cast-party.com and follow us on Facebook at CastPartyDND, on Twitter at CastParty2, on Instagram at Cast underscore Party, on TikTok at Cast underscore Party, or on threads at Cast underscore Party. As always, we're offering monthly free adventures with our Dungeon Masters. These free games fill up quickly, so if you'd like to grab a spot, you should join our email list or our Discord server. Links to both can be found at cast-party.com. If you enjoy Podcast Party, please follow the show, rate us, and leave us a review. Thanks very much for listening, and now back to our adventure in Holdenshire. I'm a little concerned that it might not want to talk to me because I took part in killing it. So is their armor small enough where a gnome could put it on? Yeah, you're pretty much the same size as these creatures, Violet. Okay, so I have a cloak which can cover my face mostly, so I'm going to try to take the armor off of the other one, just like a chest plate part. Put that on under my cloak so it's showing, but it's covering most of my face. And... I'm going to walk over to the after image of this kobold and I'm going to focus my mental energy and I'm going to try to ask it a question. So Violet, I'm going to say that you're attempting to improvise a disguise using the discarded yes. uniform of the uh, of its companion. Um, yes. So I'm going to actually say that is your choice of either a performance or mm-hmm. deception check but I will allow you to apply intelligence instead of charisma if you would like. Okay, I have something called 
<laughs> I don't know if these things can stack. Well, I'm doing one if I can do the other, but I have clerical Pitch charisma. Me. Okay. I have clerical charisma, which makes my public presence irresistible. Mm -hmm. I can gain proficiency in the performance skill whenever I use performance to deliver a sermon or sing a song <laughs> in a town or city. <laughs> I'm sort of in a town. Am I in a town still? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to call, as the French say, bullshit on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Le bullshit. Unless, le bullshit. Le bullshit. Um, un unless you plan on delivering this this uh, uh, query of the dead cobalt in the form of a song or sermon. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, though, Carrie, honestly, honestly, yeah. I'm referring here not really to your performance for the cobalt. I'm trying to judge how effective how your, good physical, my costume is? your physical disguise is, yeah. Okay, that's so fine. So I, I, I think in that case, I am going to say it's performance or deception, but you can roll with intelligence instead of charisma if you would prefer. Sounds great. I would prefer to do that. That's a 16. Okay. Ooh. So with the cloak pulled down over your features and the patchwork armor assembled, and you kind of uh, have the idea of getting the fire behind you, so yes. you're really sort of looking at more like a rough silhouette and not detailed. Mm -hmm. You know, you think you've done as managed, as good as a job as someone could do putting on someone's dead friend's clothes and talking to their ghost. Yep. Good. So what's now what's the yeah, what's the second part of this process? The second part <laughs> is I want to speak with this dead kobold using speak with dead, which I can do once per long rest. Awesome. And I don't expend a cell spell slot. I see the corpse, but I also see slightly, like if you were to take an image and slightly divide it with colors, like I see a little bit of a, it's something's off kilter and that off kilter, it looks like a ghostly image to me. And that's what's alerting me to the fact that I can do this because previously I could not do this. And I think it might have something to do with the fact that I was dead for quite some time. Yeah, this sort of shade sits up, like peels itself away from the dead husk and sits up, its eyes are glowing, and it's sort of, you know, hovering in a sitting position, maybe an inch above the corpse, and regarding you lifelessly. Great. So okay. I will I will give you the full description here, Carrie, just so you know what mm -hmm. you're dealing with. Great. Uh, the corpse knowledge is limited. It knows only what it knew in life. You can't, like, tell it a piece of information and ask it to speculate, because it has, right. like, no ability to speak about anything that has occurred since its death. And it doesn't have to tell you the truth if it doesn't have a reason to. Right. So as you as you surmise, it probably would not want to cooperate with somebody who it, who it knew killed it. Right. Before okay. You start. What does this look like to the rest of us? <laughs> the rest of you do see this shade rise from the corpse of the dead kobold, lock its eyes on Violet, and kind of hover there like a watery image, sort of staring at her. It's it's sort of bluish and translucent. It looks like like a painting that was left out in the rain and a lot of the color washed out, but it's unmistakably like a spectral image of this dead cobalt. Wow. Belton would have his hands are like elbow deep into this into this other cobalt's material possessions, <laughs> and he just turns to his right and he sees this spirit lurching out of the thing's body, and he just scrabbles back as fast as he possibly can, like 10, 15 feet. <laughs> can you refresh my memory as to the name of the they were saying a name like they were ritually chanting this name and I can't remember what it was started with a C well maybe make uh, an intelligence culture check to see if you remember that can I help her with that since they Absol chanted it quite a bit around me absolutely and if you happen to have remembered it you could just say it oh I, I don't remember I have okay. the, the memory of a goldfish the 15 down. okay Violet, they were chanting a word that you believe is Siroth. Okay. Siroth will be displeased. Did you secure the dragonborn? It slowly scrunches its face for a moment, and it says, Yes, dragonborn, virgin, virgins for Siroth, prize. We should make sure that the virgin dragonborn is delivered unscathed. I would like to accompany them, for I live and you are dead. Where did they go so I may make sure he is safe? Up river east 
farmhouse. Safe. Have you secured the female? Fought. Stabbing. Too slow. Failed. Are we satisfied with the Dragonborn, or shall we proceed into the town and find more virgin? It doesn't answer. Okay. You see, you sense it may not be able to sorry, make a judgment call about that. Right. Okay. Uh, ask it. Ask it who's who's like in charge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it would be best, with your final words, for you to praise Sira. So, please, explain the great Siroth and what he desires to me with your final breath. Can you do that? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then it yeah. falls silent. I see. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. Well, the most important thing is we know where Tlingbit is, which is what I wanted to know. Yeah, I didn't know if it was like, was it like Siroth? I, I guess he's kind of like the person who they're sacrificing virgins to, but who knows? I'm if guessing like, it's a dragon. I mean, I don't know. I don't know who Siroth is. So I'd say you you actually might. Siroth oh, is me? pretty famous. Yeah. Me, Belton? Or, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. oh, okay. Siroth is pretty famous. So why doesn't everyone, everyone can make a intelligence history check. Okay. All right. That's a nine. <laughs> Malibu got a six. Violet got a 15. 12. Violet, you alone are familiar with the name Siroth. Siroth is indeed an infamous dragon. I knew it. Literally. And I did know it. <laughs> yeah. Siroth, Siroth is the ruler of Skull Mountain and tyrant of the desolation, a blasted wasteland that was scoured by this legendary dragon. The desolation is Siroth's domain, and the land east of the mountains is considered cursed and forbidden territory. Well, this is terrible. We definitely have to get to Lingbet before Lingbet's taken there. The thing said it. They were they were bringing it to Lingbe to, uh, to the, some farmhouse to the east along the river. Yes, right? yes, yes. Would I know about a farmhouse since I am just a small town girl? This would be an intelligence check with advantage, Aria. You are quite familiar. That's a fifteen. There are a number of failed farmsteads along the riverbanks and following the road east from Hengisbury towards Thornberry. There aren't a lot of settlements between Thornberry and Blackford, so you suspect that it must be one of the old failed riverfront farms between here and Thornberry, following the river east from this, this point. They must be at one of the old farmsteads. Some people try to do it, and then they have no skill at it all, and then they have to go back to the towns and not good, but we must go now. The further he gets, we, we have to go now. Now! I don't want to, like, speak for everyone here, but, um, some of us are a little banged up. My, my buddy over here, he points to Malibu. He got a little burned. Am, am I wrong? Malibu's not paying attention. He's just going through the pockets of the kobold, see if he can find anything. How does he look? He's pretty beat up. I got burned too. It doesn't matter. The person I love is gone, and we need to go get him now! You're 100% correct. I, I'm sorry for neglecting to notice your burn status. However, we need to do a little bit more reconnaissance. I mean, we're not just going to run off in the middle of the night to this farmhouse without, at the very least, telling the rest of the, the village where we're going. Maybe even get a little bit of help. You're adventurers. You know what you're doing. I do think that would be a good idea, just to tell people, and then maybe if anybody's available. It would be good to have help, yes. We're not very far. I do think we should go quickly, but it wouldn't take very long to do that. How far away are we talking here for these, uh, farmhouses? Ariadne, the farmhouses that you're thinking of could probably be reached in about an hour. Fortunately, the river flows in the right direction. Well, Fortunately for both the kobolds and you. Are there any boats left? You'd have to scour around. You do see a couple of boats on fire. You haven't really looked to see if any of them are still intact. Is that an hour by foot or an hour by boat? 
about an hour by boat, much longer by foot. It's an hour by boat. We have no time to waste. You did see the boats, right? I mean, they're all messed up. You got any others? I'm happy to go look for some. And I kind of stomp off to see if I can see any boats that are not on fire. Yes, why don't you look for a boat and we'll go tell people what our plans are. I just yell that. Fine! Bring me bandages, please! Ariadne, I'll say wisdom, wisdom perception check to spot, try to spot uh, an undamaged boat. Okay. That's a, a dirty 20. With a dirty 20, you scan around. It looks like every exposed boat, everything that was either dragged out and left on shore or anchored to the dock, like tethered to the docks, is sunk or on fire. But casting your eyes around, it seems like the kobold missed a few that were completely dry docked, that there would have no way of knowing if they didn't live locally. There is a boathouse where uh, some of the nicer, uh, you know, the more affluent uh, fisher folk actually store their uh, vessels indoors during the night. Uh, that building looks untouched. You're thinking there are probably about three or four serviceable rowboats likely in there. Do I know whose boats might be housed in there? It's not a huge town. You know, like everybody who owns every boat. Okay. <laughs> um, so I, I yell back since they're, I'm assuming, still kind of jabbering on. I found boats. Hurry up and tell tell the town that if whosever boats are in here are being commandeered, they are going and they will maybe get them back and they can just deal with it. I like her. Like father, like daughter, if you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. Okay, so we're gonna, you know, go as fast as we can to the town, I think, and just tell people what we know. Yeah. I'm kind of interested in what Malibu found, if anything, in those kobolds. But... Yeah, is there anything on these? You search through the kobold. They don't have any money. They don't have any identifying marks on the Malibu. They're carrying little beside their makeshift armor, which I uh, described earlier, and their weaponry. There are those black fletched arrows that I mentioned earlier. Each of them also carries a cruel, jagged looking short sword. But other than that, nothing. He's going to hold some arrows out to Belton and say, uh, here, take these. You might be able to, I don't know, trick them that they're fighting with each other or something. I don't know. Here. Sorry, I should have mentioned they also each both do have a short bow. Yeah, okay. Belton graciously <laughs> accepts the arrows, kind of looks at them quizzically and says, thank you, Malibu. He just stuffs him in his quiver and moves back towards the road to town. Malibu will chuck the, the swords and the other weapons into the river just so they're not lying around. Sorry, I'm still wearing the armor. <laughs> so I'm going to take it off, roll it up and put it in my bag if I can. Sure. Ariadne, if the three of them are packing up and heading back into town, what would you like to do? I would like to investigate the boats and choose the best one, of course, the fastest one, just because I'm very worried about Tlingbet and I honestly couldn't care about the owners or anything. My only goal is getting there. I don't care how burned I am. If my hair gets burned off, it doesn't matter. Tlingbet will still love me. Awesome. So I'm going to say what you're, you're trying to ascertain like the most seaworthy and fastest boat that you can commandeer for this rescue yes. mission. I'm going to call that a wisdom survival check. A nine. Maybe your, you know, the urgency of rescuing to Lingbet takes precedence over your judgment, Ariadne. There are four boats. They all look more or less equally serviceable to you. Not caring which families will get angriest or who might be carrying boat insurance. It's you sort of just end up taking the one closest to the door. That's like the easiest to haul out. So you don't, at least don't waste time getting one from the back of the boathouse and dragging it towards the water. It does certainly look like it, it can carry four people. Well, as a note to God, is boat insurance a thing? Probably not. <laughs> but I mean, boat insurance was, is a thing in I, real life, but, well, but well, probably yes, not yes. in Hengisbury. But, yeah. but in, in this age and day, I, I would love to see someone fight about boat insurance. Like, oh, yeah. this, <laughs> this girl just stole my boat yep. and she didn't care. <laughs> Pay for a new one. <laughs> when Malibu sees her struggling with the boat a little bit, maybe not struggling, but doing the boat by herself, he kind of huffs and goes, I'll go help her with the boat. I'll be here. See you guys in a little bit. And he'll go help her haul the boat and get it ready. 
So Belton and Violet, you arrive back in town. The town is fully awake. The bell is ringing in the temple steeple. The streets are full of people. It is a rather steamy late summer evening. The air is alive with crickets. People are in their bedclothes, running, sobbing. You see people hugging each other, consoling each other. Others calling for people who seem to be missing, trying to find lost loved ones. It, it quickly becomes apparent to you just by casual observation that multiple people seem to have been taken from Hengistbury. Mm -hmm. Lights are streaming out of the temple where you left uh, Sheriff Brand Torek and Lady Pemberton. Uh, you make your way in to see uh, Lady Pemberton has been joined by her husband, uh, Lord Pemberton. Brand Torek is lying unconscious. A bed has been brought in, probably from the uh, Hen and Philly across the street, because it, it seems like they don't want to move the sheriff. There is a cold cloth over his head. There are several of Lady Pemberton's servants tending to him. He seems to be resting peacefully. Lord and Lady Pemberton rise as you enter. And she says, what news? What has happened? We ran down to the docks after we realized that uh, Ariadne was uh, being uh, Is kidnapped. she all right? Uh, the sheriff's she, daughter? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, sheriff's, sheriff Torek's daughter. Yes, that's correct. Uh, yes, she's, she's okay. Uh, she, <laughs> she helped us uh, take out a couple of those uh, nasty kobolds, actually. Uh, Malibu, our, our compatriot, is down there with her. No need to worry about her. Uh, actually, more worried about uh, Sheriff Torek. Is he all right? Is he going to be okay? He will recover, but what are the children? The children that were taken? Yes, well, unfortunately, are you familiar with a dragon named Siroth? The Pembertons exchange a pale glance. Lord Pemberton looks up at you. He doesn't rise from the chair where he's sitting, and he says, Yes, we know Siroth. It is a legendary and fell name in these parts. What has the dragon to do with this? Well, we spoke with the kobolds, and um, it appears that Siroth has designs on virgins, I'm sorry to say, and it appears that they've come to kidnap any available virgins that there were here. The good news is we have a location, which is a farmhouse upriver to the east, and uh, that's where we'd like to head. And we were coming to tell you that that's our plan. And if there's anyone who could help us, we'd gladly uh, take that help. And that we are also going to need to borrow some boats. Lady Pemberton looks at you with concern and fear in her eyes. And she says, in a desperate moment such as these, no one would begrudge you a boat. Uh, thank you for informing us, but please go after them. Don't waste time with us. No harm must befall the children. And to Lingbet. Yes, uh, precisely. It, it just seemed better to tell you than to disappear, and then you wouldn't know where they were, in case we should fail, which I'm sure we won't. Of course I understand. As to aid, uh, she looks at the unconscious Bran Torek. The sheriff is wounded, the deputies slaughtered. We have, of course, sent messengers to Thornbury and Blackford and even Northminster, but it'll be, it'll be days. Something that would help other than lending us people, and I understand that you have a lot of injured people to deal with, but if you do in some way have any healing potions or other support-like items you could give us, that would be helpful as well. Yes, yes, of course. That I can provide. My own magics are exhausted for this night, but I think I still do have... She opens up a wicker chest that is next to the altar where she's sort of turned this place into a makeshift triage and she removes three healing potions and quickly passes them to you. Oh, thank you so much. A quick question. Is it possible Albert Wright is still about? She says, has anyone seen Mr. Wright? There is a, a voice from the back of the temple. It says, yes, uh, Lady Pemberton, I'm I'm here. Uh, I, I just uh, popped in to see if there's anything I can do to help. Of course, I've, um, <laughs> it's a full-time job minding my chimera. Yes. Yes, you mind that chimera. Make sure it doesn't, you know, get out and, and, and eat anyone. Make sure that those, those bars are thick on that cage. We're done. Am I, am I right, Albert? Well, yes, I've got the chimera, um, and you've been paid. So forgive me, was there something further? No, 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 I just wanted to make sure, because we're going to go off and try to rescue our friend. I wanted to know yeah, if no, you had... No, please, there's children kidnapped and poor Tlingbet's gone missing? Yes, 
Okay. I've, I've got the chimera well in hand. You can trust me. Nothing can possibly go wrong with my captured chimera. <laughs> Belton gulps a breath of air and then turns towards Lady Pemberton and says, One last thing, Lady Pemberton. I, I know you're a very powerful user of magic. He pulls out the dwarven dagger that he found or perhaps was gifted by Malibu and hands it to Lady Pemberton and says, seems like a really fancy dagger. Maybe, if at all possible, you could tell me if this is a special dagger, magic dagger. You think you might have something you could tell me about it? She says, if you bring it back in the morning, there is a spell I could use to identify it, but I'm afraid that I've exhausted all my magic this evening helping the wounded already. Of course, of course. Uh, I'm not going to begrudge you that, of course. But in the morning, assuming we survive, but in the morning... Uh, be more than. <laughs> Lord Pemberton looks at it and goes, "Magic, certainly, and dwarven." That helped me. Thank you so much, Lord Pemberton. Your brain. I mean, wow. Now I know why you are the Lord. Were you injured, Belton? Not at all, actually. Not. St- I mean, struck in uh, the head at no, all? No, no. <laughs> my head is taps on it perfectly, solid as a rock. Just a little nervous. Don't like to get myself in, you know, disaster after disaster after disaster, which seems to Seem be the to be- plan. Casting about in a lot of directions. I'm a little nervous. This is what I kind of do when I'm uh, faced with mortal danger. We have have a bit of a boat ride. I think that might calm him. Perhaps a glass of water for Belton? Water. Sure, water. Somebody's pressing a clay mug uh, filled with water into your hands, Belton. Mm. Hold on a second. (laughs) All right, just deep deep breath, Belton. Mm -hmm. There, there. She taps you. She sort of pats you gently on the back. Oh, that was good. Yes, well, thank you very much. With the sheriff wounded and the deputies dead, you and your friends are probably the only capable rescuers. Oh, boy. We won't let you down. I know. I know you won't. You've saved us before during the summer festival. You've bravely captured the chimera that was savaging the livestock in the hills. Everyone here has tremendous faith in you and your friends. She puts both her hands on your shoulders and sort of bends her knees till she's kind of like eye level with you, Belton. And you notice crowded in the doorway of the temple are Michael Ferris with his three daughters kind of arranged before him, trying not to be in your line of sight, but all sort of peering at you. Belton gulps as he is immediately feeling judged. His life is in your hands, dude. (laughs) 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 I love the fact that she said that to me. (laughs) <laughs> Lord Pemberton asked me to repeat that. His life is in your hands. <laughs> thank, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. He just takes, takes a hand, puts it on her hand, gives it a tap and breathes a couple times and says, all right, we're up to it. Let's head on down to the boats. Mm. Another 20 minutes and you are back down at the docks. By this point, Malibu and Ariadne have pulled out. It's a, it's a rather like handsome bougiest boat yeah it's sort of got like a red and orange flare to it and it's got like fake fins like decorative fins probably left over from the summer festival and there's the words tomorrow's sunset are painted in bold letters on the side and there are stylized smiling fish drawn on the side like as if they're leaping out of the water and smiling and winking in profile to people observing the boat from either side so this is not a stealth boat, is what I'm getting. <laughs> it was the closest boat to the door of the boathouse. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> okay, uh, uh, this, is, this boat is good? Yes, get in the boat. Okay. Yep. We need to discuss something here. I love your spunk, and I understand you're very upset. We also love Tillingbed, and we're here to help, so don't worry. We're here. You don't need to yell at us. Let's get in the boat now. I take a big, deep breath and just try and, like, release that tension. Just, (sighs) thank you. I am sorry. I am under a lot of stress. I'm very worried. Everyone I love is either injured or captured. I I don't have a lot of friends. We're here. Are are you my friends? Of course. Friend adjacent. Now let's go. I'll push us off. Let's go. Come on. Everybody in. The boat glides into the water. It seems very seaworthy. You each grab an oar and start paddling, and it cuts pretty nimbly 
eastward following the flow of the river. I'm going to ask for a group survival check, and I will say, Ariadne, since you are very familiar with the Moor Run River, having spent most of your life on it, your check will be made with advantage. Oh, uh, wis- wisdom survival. I can't use strength because I'm really strong and good at rowing. It's not to do with speed. It's to do with uh, locating the farmhouse along the riverbank. I'm so sorry. I got a seven. Uh, that's that's a nine from me. Malibu got a 15. That's pretty and good. And Belton also got a 15. A group success. Right. Ariadne, you scan the riverbanks as you proceed, and you recall a particularly isolated farm that sits not on the river itself. The farmers attempted to grow rice along the moor run using a tributary of the river, barely navigable by boat. If you were looking for a hideout, someplace that might go weeks or months might go by without a visitor coming within 200 yards of the place, that old burned out farm might be the first place you'd think of. So you give it a shot, follow the tributary that you're familiar with. The tributary eventually dries into a stream, and you're forced to pull the boat along the bank. It's no longer deep enough to be navigable by the tomorrow's sunrise. And then the stream becomes a muddy gulch. You follow the gulch into a shallow, stony vale, littered with rounded rocks of all sizes, running to the southwest. In wetter seasons, clearly water must flow here. But now the riverbed appears dry in the summer. Tal, were there other boats around? You did not see any other boats. With that one-hour trip down river, would you consider that a short rest? Yeah, I'll consider that a short rest. Once we get on the land, Malibu's going to go in his bag and he's going to say, Violet, 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 Violet. Yes, 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 yes. And he's going to take out that piece of paper that, with the funny letters and stuff on it. Here, I think this is uh, magic. And he's going to give her the scroll of mirror image. Oh, thank you so much. You can have it. That's very kind. You're welcome. You helped me, so... Let me see. Let me see how your colors are coming along. I was going to say, there's a lot of white in his hair now. Oh, uh, I know Mort didn't cheer you up. I, I'd i love to think of something that might cheer you up and get your bright colors back. Mm, not dying? Yes, you're not dead. That's good, I guess. I'm feeling a little sad. I don't know. Really? Yeah. I don't know what happened. I feel sad. Do you know when it started? Yeah, when I almost died. Oh, I know it is hard to almost die. It's hard to die. But I'm here, and you never know what could happen. So I really do think maybe it's good to just think about the things you have now and focus on that. His eyes just go wide, and he doesn't know what to make of her, and he just kind of stares at her, and a little bit of drool comes out of his mouth. Uh, Okay, okay. Okay. Well, you just think about that. I'll try to find something else to cheer you up, though. Great. Thank you. Okay. There's a copse of trees more or less due south of you, and peering through those, you can make out the walls of this abandoned farmhouse. Thanks for listening. This episode was Dungeon Mastered by me, Tal Aviazer, and featured Andy Canistra as Malibu, Carolyn Fox as Violet, Matt Gordon as Belton Friedew, and introducing actor, cosplayer, and custom costume designer Amber Heck as Ariadne Torek. You can follow Amber on Instagram at sunblade underscore cosplayer. This episode was edited by Carolyn Fox and me. Some sound effects in this episode are courtesy of Sirenscape. Remember, if you enjoy Podcast Party, please follow the show, rate us, and leave us a review. Thanks very much for listening. We'll be back in two weeks with the next episode of Descent into Avernus, and in four weeks with the next episode of To Slay a Dragon. Thank <sighs> you.